Hello, recorders. I'm reporting to you live from LA Comic Con 2021. It's been amazing coming back to this show, and it's recording time! Comic-Con and we are going out with a bang. Did you love the Power Rangers panel? Wasn't that awesome? So do we got any Dread Star fans out there? Yeah, so let me hear it. Make, make a little more noise. Dread Star? Yes! Okay, well we have got a spotlight today on Jim Starlin, famed, iconic comic book writer and creator of Dread Star, Thanos, and so many more. And this panel is gonna be moderated by Koi Jandru from Collider, Nor Nerdist, and Koi Cast. Whoa, that's a mouthful. Give it up for Koi, come on out here. Make some noise. How's it going, guys? Yeah. All right, so I can't even believe this is happening right now. We're about to talk all sorts of goodness, and I'm not, I'm not going to start until I bring out the great Jamie Jameson and the legend himself, Jim Starlin. Let's hear it for him. Yeah. Yes. We would not have the universe of comics today without the people on this stage. That makes me so very happy. How you doing, guys? Yeah, let's get into it. We have limited time. Let's go. Okay, so how many of you know this new Dreadstar book that just dropped? How many of you are about to know this new Dreadstar book that just dropped? <laughs> there we go. So this book was a beautiful collaboration between these two, and it was done in the most punk rock way. They got to make this book themselves with their creativity using so much comic infrastructure and knowledge. So I want to know, when you first got the idea, what was it like going, hey, we're going to do this our way, not go to the big two, this is a punk rock character, let's go. What was the process? Well, to start off with, I hadn't drawn in three years because I had blown a hole in my hand. And, There's uh, twists. It, took it was me, gross. Yes, it took me a while to get it operating again, and then it took this lady here to uh, annoy me enough to uh, do a drawing. She kept bugging me for a sketch. Uh, not for Thanos, Dr. Doom. <laughs> and so I was trying to ignore her for the longest time, but she's not easy to ignore. And uh, once I got that and found I could draw, uh, through a series of events, I found she could ink uh, really well. And uh, I pressed her on to becoming the inker on Dreadstar, which was your first full book. Full graphic novel, yes. First full book, period, and it was 100 pages long. Yeah. So nothing intimidating <laughs> about that, was it? He fails to mention that I used to ink for Keith Giffen, and Keith was notorious for deciding at the last minute, eh, I don't want to go to the show. So I showed up to his show and had nothing to do because I was going to ink Keith Giffen. So he was like, well, if I do some bad drawings, will you make them look good with your inks? Like, let's see what you can do. And that's how it started. And they surprised me. They were really good. <laughs> yeah, he was like, maybe we could sell these. <laughs> so no. she was on the west coast and I was on the east coast and we went to a convention together in Mexico City and we were 25 pages or so into the book and you came back and you got COVID really badly really badly so we had a little interruption in that and we got back to it again and you got COVID a second time anything to get on really work. really badly <laughs> yes. like almost dying badly this time so this book uh, was really an odyssey and a test on everything we did here. So uh, uh, it's a, more than a labor of love, it's uh, blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> I quit about 50 times in. 50 times. You when, when you pick up a comic, you think like it's difficult, there's a lot on the page, there's a lot going on, but the, the level of difficulty in the last two years plus these very specific occurrences. But what I love about comics, me personally, is it's such a direct through line from the creators to the consumers. It's it's there's such a small credits page. Like you look at a movie and you're watching credits and credits and credits. And we're gonna talk post credits in a minute, a certain Eternals post credit scene. Don't you worry. But with credits, it's it's a, an artist, an inker, a writer, and maybe five other names. What did you feel came from your soul that made you love 
fans so much? And what did you find in working with that character so long that made you go like, oh, this is a piece of me? Let's see. Well, Vanth, uh, he's kind of an idiot in some ways. Like, he's a destroyer of worlds while needing to do well. Um, I kind of just fell in love with, like, I, I love Eddie. Eddie's probably my favorite out of the group. He seems to be the probably the smartest out of the bunch other than Willow. But uh, And then you've he's got... He's the most human. Yes, he's the cat guy is the most human of them all. Worth noting he's a cat person. Yes. Most human. <laughs> most human is the cat person. And then you've got Two-Tone, who's just an imbecile with a big heart. So, I mean, you kind of fall in love with the characters because they are so different, and it's kind of like kind of like a Seinfeld. None of them actually seem like they would be friends, but they are, and they do it together <laughs> with Galaxy Serial. And Jim, you've described him as an anarchist without a second act, which is such, like I said, this is a punk rock book. That's such a cool log line. Again, you're now going to know Dreadstar. What's it like for you to write a character that's always like the ultimate cop on the edge? Like this is like Martin Riggs to a thousand. Well, there's a certain autobiographical quality to uh, <laughs> Van fan. looks just like... Uh, I'm really good at breaking things and not fixing them also. Uh, but... Uh, you know, he's like going back to seeing an old friend. It was like 20 some odd years between the last book that I did and coming back to this. And it was doing a transition, so I wanted them to have that 25 years also and show what they have all been doing during that time and how they have worked themselves into the system that they inadvertently created at the end of my last run. And uh, it was... It was fun because it was all these little things that 20 years later I looked at and said, you know, this one character that was in the story, I, I, I was never satisfied with what happened to him or her. I'm not going to give that part away. <laughs> and uh, so this character is brought back in uh, as a sort of this central threat, uh, but he's not a menace or a thing. He's a threat. And, uh, Don't give too much away, Jim. Yes, yes. I still want to get the book. His, okay. his relationship to the rest of them is really kind of interesting. So before we get to spoilers, because obviously you need to read the book, I do want to talk spoilers for another thing. A minute ago I mentioned credits. I'm going to spoil a certain post credit scene. You guys might know what I'm talking about. How many of you have seen Eternals? Yeah. Should we talk about two characters at the end of Eternals that might have something to do with this gentleman on stage? Yeah! Okay, Who so... Who would that be? <laughs> How many Harrys are in this audience? It feels good. It feels good right here. What was it like to see a scene with two characters that are that specific to you? These are not your man. These are not Spider-Man or Batman. These are Eros and Pip the Troll, as played by Patton Oswalt and Harry Styles. What was it like to see the first time on a 70-foot screen? Well, to tell you the truth, we we couldn't make it to the premiere. Uh, I had a family obligation I had to get to, so the day after the premiere, everyone on the planet started calling me up and saying, Pip Heroes, Pip Heroes. And uh, so it took me a while to actually get to see the film. And the tricky part was, it was easy to find things online about what Harry Styles looked like as Heroes, but you couldn't find Pip. <laughs> and I kept looking around Harry's. and finally I found this one shot that was from a design studio Holy and it was this guy this big hunk of a guy in armor with these pointy ears and it was for something a, it was a design for an os, uh, outfit for him that they never used and all I could think of is this is Pip the Hunk yeah exactly <laughs> sexy Pip the Troll is that? Yes, and finally when I actually saw the show and he falls down on his face with a, a stein of beer in his hand, I said, that's right, that's the way it should be. <laughs> so I was pleased, I was pleased. And that's how you introduced those two characters, and that was such a great, like, where are we going to go from here? Like, those are, that's one of my favorite post-credit scenes in the MCU. But you also have your hand in another post-credit scene in the MCU. Uh, there's a guy, he snaps a lot, like a West Side Story thing. <laughs> what was it like for you knowing before the rest of us how this trajectory of Marvel is gonna go because you invented a character that I never thought my grandma would call me about. And now my grandma and I talk about Thanos. No, I always thought he was too dark and esoteric and uh, it was just too strange to realize that he was actually going up there. And then I did this uh, little cameo uh, between the two films 
when they were shooting it, and the writers and the director, Joe Russo, like, told me everything. I mean, you know, they figured I had assigned a dis non-disclosure form also, so I was fair game to talk to. And they're excited to get to talk about it. And I had to keep my mouth shut for a year and a half, two years, about what they had told me because I assigned a non-disclosure. Uh, in fact, I was told that uh, I was the only person who they've ever had do a cameo who actually kept his mouth shut about it. Uh, but you should ask him about know. his cameo. I mean, we're looking at you, Tom Holland, but also your cameo. No, no, no. About recording that cameo. Yeah, no, I got to know, because you were not just with the Russos themselves on both sides of the camera, one of them next to you, but also you're with Captain America, someone you've worked with abstractly, and now you're working with linearly. What was it like filming an Avengers movie? Um, it, was, it was surreal, like everything else involved in this damn business. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he, Chris kept jumping up and checking his phone between takes <laughs> because he had, I, he was, I think he had some money down on a football game. <laughs> no pants. So everybody left him alone every time he jumped up and uh, there was a number of other people there uh, who were working, actors who, uh, and I kept asking questions like they had this big globe thing for setting up the exposures and that and I asked what that was and uh, one of the actors next to me uh, said, is this your first time on the set? And I said, yeah. And he goes, how did you get this gig first time? <laughs> and I said, oh, I sort of wrote this thing this is all based on. And he gave me this really skeptical look. And it just, it just happened, Joe Ru uh, Russo was walking by and he went, he did, and kept right on going. <laughs> so it, it was, like I said, it's been surreal since the beginning. And now, you write very cosmic and existential work, and your inks allow that depth to really sing. There's a lot of in these books that feel very esoteric and out there, and you're kind of living that lifestyle, talking about all your set experiences, making these things. The world's a lot. What do you think inspires each of your brains to go to that very otherworldly place in your creative work? Do you have a process? You sit down in the morning, have some coffee, have some other things? I have insane dreams. I have the most vivid, insane dreams, and that's where some of my stories and my writing comes from. Like, I mean, I told him about mine last night, and he was like, that's really messed up. That's dark. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but it was like, this is a story somewhere. Put it in the art. Yes. <laughs> and uh, also our process has been changing as we go along. Yeah. We've been becoming more collaborative. Uh, actually, we're, I'm, Four pages done from finishing the next pencils on the next book, which is Dread Star versus the Inevitable, which is kind of a um, pandemic story, but it's not a pandemic. And we keep uh, collaborating more and more on these things until the one that we're following, we're going to co-write. The, the, third, the book third book will be the co-writing. And also Willow. I mean, Willow, I, Dread Star was before my time. I did know of Dread Star. She didn't when, like Willow. I was like, I'm sorry, she is not sexy. So I was like, let's update her. I bombarded him with pictures of boots, hairstyles, oh outfits. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds. He was so annoyed, but we I got it right. I had JPEGs right. coming on my ears of hairstyles. <laughs> I was like, no, now she's sexy. And he's like, well, she looked like a Gibson girl back then. You mean Debbie Gibson? I mean, hello, what's a Gibson girl? Charles now Gibson. I know. <laughs> I did ask about Harry Styles fans. There's a leap to Gibson girl, I think, from those two things. Yeah. Even for me. <laughs> Turn of the last century illustrator. So, yeah, I'm old style. What can I tell you? It's, it's interesting seeing how the things from, from different decades influence modern art. And I learned something today, just now backstage. I'm, an, I'm a 90s kid. I grew up, Maximum Carnage is one of my favorite runs of Spider-Man. Huge Maximum Carnage fan. How many of you got the doppelganger Funko Pop? That exclusive Funko? I gotta know what was the man invented doppelganger on top of all of these other things, and that wasn't uh, you didn't think that would come back in any way. No, no, no. He was well. He didn't make it through the first issue of the Infinity War. Uh, I think he ended up on a picket fence somewhere. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, Ron and I decided we were just going to do doppelgangers of all the evil doppelgangers of all the characters, and he was one of the first ones that designed up because. I killed him off early on in the story. <laughs> and to come here and see him on a pop, that was a real surprise, to say the least. Yeah, when You're the first person brought it up, he was like, wait, 
Arnaz, you did. Arnaz, where did this come from? <laughs> and for you experiencing the, the medium of comic books evolve, because you've been in it in so many different mediums, you've been exposed to comics in so many different ways, is there anything that you're experiencing coming out of the pandemic back to this world of cons that you're seeing as a, as a positive change to the industry as a whole? Well, I think uh, people are more, like they had time to sit and read or catch up and like, they were bored. So they, like younger kids are more familiar with the older comics. I mean, I, there was like a five-year-old kid that knew more about the history of, of Batman. I was just like, wait, <laughs> what? He's telling me all this stuff and I'm just like floored that this kid knew. He was like, well, I was home a lot. I was just like, <laughs> that seems to be a very common thing after this pandemic. So maybe younger people are catching up. We're gonna learn about Gibson girls. So we're gonna get them. Yeah. Any experience for you, Jim, that surprised you post pandemic? Like at these, we've done two cons recently. Anything you've noticed is like a, a change in the pulse in the comic book culture? It's lower key, uh, it's not as, uh, people aren't in, in, well, not in your faces, <laughs> side the point. Um, I've discovered if I want to go incognito, all I have to do is put a baseball cap on. <laughs> they still recognize and No one knows who I am then. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, you know, the folks who are here are more appreciative of what you're doing now. Uh, I think everybody's got a deeper sense of their own mortality and appreciation for life. And so the things you enjoy, you enjoy more. Yeah. 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 I guess, I, I don't know about you guys, but this has been a game changer for me realizing how much I love this. This world is so special and each and every one of you, us all gathering for this is just so magical. But on the other side, this guy killed Robin. So <laughs> I want to know what it's like to be told, hey, this isn't going so well, what do you want to do? And actually have the fans decide the fate of a pretty big character. What was it like? You, you wrote two versions, I think? Uh, there's two pages at the end that were alternate, you know, where he survives in that, that I never figured he was going to survive. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I know what ghouls you guys are. <laughs> and I figured it was going to be overwhelmingly killed a little stinker. <laughs> But it was uh, statistically, uh, out of 10,000 votes, statistically it was tied. There was only like 70 votes uh, determining the difference. And uh, I was down in Mexico at the time and uh, hanging out with some friends and uh, didn't do any voting on myself. And when I came back and found out how close it was, I was, Ooh, really? <laughs> 71, I'm killing Robin. <laughs> but I did get a lot of free beers the next time I went down there. <laughs> because I was the guy who killed off Robin. <laughs> Comics have been dark for a while. Now, now, this book in itself is very dark because there's there's nihilistic elements, there's elements, like we said, uh, that not a second act. When you're writing and illustrating a book that you're controlling to this level, do you ever find yourself a few pages in or a few panels in and going like, oh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. He added two pages in the midst after, and I'm talking way into the 70s of this book. Oh, I'm going to add a new 9 and 10. It threw my numbering off so bad. So I'm sitting here looking. I, I'm missing a page here. I didn't get this scan. But I, I've done them all. I've sent them to you. And the numbering just got all screwed up. And also his writing of the numbers. A 7 looks like a 2. A 4 looks like a 7. Yeah, adding those you, two pages. You wouldn't pages. believe the complaining I've been listening to over the last few weeks. It's a dense medium. There's a lot to do. Now, now, when you're releasing these books, and this is one of my moments of pride, is I got to hold the hardcover before the anchor. And, and as a journalist, we don't get that very often. But getting to experience the books in, in physical form after going, you know, in, in, the, in the old days, it was mailing the books pages across the country, getting inks and all that jazz. And now we're scanning, we're doing more coloring digitally and all that. What's it like as a creator to, to hold these books and see your kids come to life in a way? What's that first experience like? Well, we were probably the last ones that got to flip through our book. We were doing... Actually, you were with us the first time we got to see our book. <laughs> we hadn't seen it. So we were like, oh, what does our book look like? I was there for the birth. Yes, he was. We, we had no idea. We were doing an interview with Koi. And uh, I was like, oh, look at this page. Like, what should we hold up? Like, flipping through. And he's like... We have to do the interview. Well, Corey, like, I don't want to see the book. Corey's asking you questions, and we're ignoring the book. <laughs> do you see this? I know I'm asking about it, and I do see this. Also, I, I have to mention, I mention it in every interview, there's a, there's a two-page spread in Dreadstar that is one of the most cosmic, time warpy, crazy. If you're a fan of Cosmic Marvel, if you're a fan of existential dread DC, 
There's this insane trippy page <laughs> that is like mind warping and altering. When you're illustrating something like that, what's the conversation back and forth with you adding depth to something oh, that's surrealistic? This is funny. I went behind and he was like, well, I meant it to go over, but I was like, well, I thought it looked better under and I couldn't tell what was going on. It was like being on acid. <laughs> Over, under, through reality. Yeah, it literally is like, oh, well, it does work that way. I kind of like that. But I do the coloring, so I get the final say on what goes on top. But then I tell him, that doesn't look right. Can you fix that? And she does. And this is the stuff you don't see from comic creators. It's so fascinating. We're like, oh, yeah, I'm sure they just mail each other stuff. Cut to, like, over, under, through, color, <laughs> black, red. Maybe Batman's been purple this whole time, and we've never known. <laughs> No. We had one page where uh, I was on, my notes on the thing was a strange creature. And oh, uh, yeah. we were texting back and forth. I said, what kind of strange creature do you think I had to do? And she sent me a list of I them. said, it should be a combination of a Venus flytrap and th a this and that. Like, and I sent like 20 things. I was like, and combine it. And it was so cool. I was like, this is going to be so cool. But then he goes and has to top it off by adding an eyeball, a floating eyeball. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't say to add a floating eyeball. It was mine. It was mine. <laughs> Always has to top me off. I mean, who doesn't love a good floating eyeball? Now, in, in this world, to me, the closest parallel to, to the big two books is your work on Marvel, And that is so formative to not just phase four, but I think the whole direction we're going phase five and beyond. What was it like working on a book that was so mainstream and making it so not mainstream at the time? Well, it was on its way to the extinction, actually. Uh, I was given that book uh, with the, the determination that I might be able to get the first issue out before they cancel it, because uh, it, was, it, was it was part of a wave of new books that they had put out, and the first two issues had really tanked, and they, you know, they said, this is never going to last. And I had just been fired off Iron Man. And so uh, they... Uh, said, go and do whatever you want. And I found that, you know, if you take books that nobody's looking at, you can do whatever you want <laughs> and have a lot of fun. And strangely enough, they begin to sell. And uh, so Captain Marvel stayed around. And after that, it was Warlock because nobody wanted to do Warlock either because he had already tanked. He, he had already gone down the drain. So uh, I found that the dead ones are the best ones to play with. <laughs> Lesson to creators. Find the stuff no one's looking at. Make it crazy. Well, I think he was also trying to hide under the radar from Stan and stuff. I think uh, he didn't mention that he got fired and then snuck his way to keep the job by doing something else. <laughs> and actually, it's something that other folks have done. Uh, Frank Miller started off on Daredevil, and nobody cared about Daredevil at that time. Yeah. You know, that was a that was a uh, on the life support title. <laughs> <laughs> actually, yeah, this is, a, this is a great place to speak about Stan. What was it like working for Stan? <laughs> uh, Stan was surreal. Um, Stan was an actor who uh, got sidetracked at 17 into becoming an editor because his uncle owned a business, and he never got over it. And that's why you see him in all these uh, uh, cameos throughout. Um, at his uh, memorial, Paul Bethany, who plays the uh, Vision, said Stan was, has been in more movies than he will have been himself throughout his entire career. And it was true. And so Stan finally uh, was a guy who, a teenage boy who got his dream later on in life through the most circuitous route that you can imagine. Sometimes you have to invent your entire universe to put yourself in it, but that's how you put yourself in it. Now, speaking of Stan and this year's movies at Marvel, Shang-Chi was maybe my biggest, I'm really excited for this, but just blew me out of the water. It just went places. What did you guys both think of Shang-Chi, the first experience through I mean, we were with you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, that first scene, the fight scene between the two, not the bus scene, that is really, really mad cool. But the first actual fight scene that was just so, the, the choreography was just Sensual. beautiful. Very just beautiful. Um, and I thought that the fact that these people actually studied martial arts and act, it was real martial art fighting. It, didn't, it wasn't like actors just acting like they knew how to do it. I thought that was so essential and I thought they did such a great job. I had... Very low expectations, he will back me up on that. I was not as excited, and, and then I would left so happy and blown away. Yeah, everybody kept saying, no, this one's not going to work. This one's not going to work. You're going to lose out on this one. And I'm going, I don't know, the director's pretty cool. They're, they got a humorous writer on it. You know, this, we'd seen uh, the actor uh, 
being surprised on stage, finding out how he no, was. I loved Aquafina. She was so funny. Yeah. So, you know, I was the only one who seemed to have any hope for this one, and uh, I was proven right. Yeah. You know? The only thing I was wrong was I thought it was Fing Fang Foom who was the dragon. Same! Same! Oh, I kept teasing, and I was like, it's time, it's coming. No, we'll wait some more. We'll get there. Yeah, I, I was at the premiere, and I was talking to Kevin Feige, and I said, well, at least you bring in the Fing Fang, and he goes, <laughs> well, not exactly. <laughs> I mean, Finn You did boom. mention Pip the Troll, though, and you were pleasantly surprised. Yes. Yeah, I do feel like Pip and Eros are a bigger what than Finn <laughs> Fang Foom, which is saying something. Well, I have been lobbying Kevin for like the last four years for Pip. Yeah. And he's been able to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> but he also look, look wanted Tom Cruise to play Pip the Troll. <laughs> <laughs> That is the exclusive of this panel. I can't stop that. That's going to conclude our time, and he is the right height for Pip the Troll. I love that so much. Let's give it up for Jim Starlin and Jamie Jameson, folks. Check out Dress Star Returns. If you want to see people creating live, that's the book. It's so special. It's amazing. Thank you all so much. We're going to take a photo. We're going to take a selfie with y'all. Because that's what the internet is.